Hello and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Jacob Finlay with Fullbay and I'm here along with Chris O'Brien. We're excited to present this webinar on inventory and uh, we're going to get started. Good afternoon everyone. By way of introduction, um, I'm one of the founders of Full Bay. I'm a CPA by trade. Um, you can see a bit of my background there. There's a picture of me and Chris. Chris is the one in the white hat. Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm definitely the good looking guy to the left of this photo. Yes. So yes, if you're is. just wondering. But yeah, I'm, I'm your, your, your average uh, fleet guy. I've been in the fleet business for quite a while. I've managed a private fleet of various trucks across multiple states. Um, I've trained well over a thousand technicians at Full Bay. And I have some, uh, um, you know, just some skills in project management and whatnot over the years. Um, but uh, basically, you're a practical, realistic guy who, you know, can help you learn inventory or run a shop. A couple housekeeping items. Um, we're using GoToWebinar for this one. And the way it works is over to the right side of your screen, you're going to see something similar to this kind of side panel thing. If you want to make that smaller, there's a little red arrow on there you can click. And if you want to make it bigger, you just click it again. And to kind of interact with this, um, we, want to, we want to test it out. So there's a place on that side panel for you to enter a question. Uh, so if you have any questions during the webinar, we, we're going to have time to answer questions at the end. So if it comes up during the webinar, feel free to type it out right down there. And to just kind of test that out um, as kind of is tradition, uh, if you guys could just type in the question section there what state or province you are dialing in from. Love to see that. So go ahead on the side panel there, expand the questions section, and then uh, let us know where you guys are coming from. All right, we're seeing a bunch of responses coming in now. Cool. All over the place. All over the US Next, and Canada. Florida, Pennsylvania, Washington. Yeah, US and Canada, awesome. All right, so feel free uh, over in that question section, uh, Shoot over any questions that you have, and we'll get uh, to those at the end, as many as we can. Another thing we're going to do, we're going to have three of these polling questions along the way. And it kind of gives us a feel for who we're talking to and, um, and uh, helps lead the discussion. And so the first polling question we want to jump right into, this one is, uh, how much does it typically cost to carry inventory for one year? All right, so this is... This is kind of a known quantity out there. It's a bit of a quiz. So what I'm going to do is publish this question so that you can answer it on your screen. All right, so you should see that question on your screen now. How much does it typically cost to carry inventory? So go ahead and answer that. We'll see, we'll see as these responses come in. And if you're looking for the response I had, which was, I have no idea, uh, we didn't have to. I refused didn't, to include that one. Yeah, Jacob just said, no You have way. to choose something. Not doing it. <laughs> you have to choose something. But I have no idea, to be honest with you. <laughs> okay. Looks like about 70% 70, 70 of you have responded to that poll. We'll give you another couple seconds here. Looks like that's, looks like that's slowing down. All right, I'm going to close that poll and uh, share the results, see what we got here. All right, so nobody said 0%, good job. Uh, it looks like the 15% won out, 15%, 43% of you said 15%. Now the answer obviously is gonna vary depending on circumstances, but the rule of thumb out there is actually 20%. Uh, your annual carrying cost is tends to be about 20% of the value of your inventory. Um, so thanks for, for answering those questions. We're going to jump right into the, the first slide here. And it deals with carrying costs. So jumping in here, 20% seems kind of high, but when you really dig into it and start adding this stuff up, this is, this is more um, my realm, uh, the annoying accountant realm, right? Where we actually have to uh, put a dollar figure here. Here's some, of the, here's some of the costs that you're going to be facing. Cost of the space. So what you see in a lot of uh, truck repair shops is inventory is kept in a space that could have an alternative use as a bay. It's very common. And so what's the opportunity cost of that space? Or another way to figure this is say 10 to 20% of your, your shop is used to store inventory. What's your total lease payment or mortgage payment on the shop? How much of that money is going to actually store the inventory? So you add up that cost. 
Another one is the opportunity cost of the money in your inventory. So say you have, you know, one or $200,000 worth of inventory sitting there. Well, there's a, there's a, at least a risk-free rate of return that you could be getting on that money if it weren't sitting in inventory. So let's say 5%, 200,000 in inventory, that alone right there is 10,000 a year potentially. So the opportunity cost of the money, then of course we've all seen this, the damage to parts. Yeah. Um, they get mishandled, maybe we pull it out of inventory, we're gonna use it, don't end up using it, but it doesn't quite make its way back. Yeah. And a great case in point, um, just in a, in a different life, um, I used to oversee about you know, $44 million worth of inventory. And believe it or not, and just damage and shrink, we were running um, at a high $2 million a year. That's a lot of hands, fingerprinting product. That's a lot of things happening through the, through the delivery cycle, et cetera. Obviously, there's a lot of projects around, you know, get that cash bleeding out to stop, but um, real world scenario. And um, on average, across the organization, it was about a million bucks. And when you added the inventory um, for three different locations, there was a point of it just being acceptable. Um, obviously, that only lasts for so long and it becomes unacceptable. There's some of this that you can't prevent. It's just part of doing business. But yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a real cost. So then the more, the more of this inventory you have, the more of it is subjected to, yeah. to damage. Uh, obsolescence um, also very common. Uh, if you guys think about how, how many how many parts do you guys have in inventory right now, where nobody knows what it is, and you haven't sold it, or you bought the shop exactly. and you bought it with the shop, and it's still in the shop. That shoe, that thing was probably purchased with U.S. dollars that could have been put to some other use, but instead it was bought in that part, and there it sits on the shelf obsolete. So that's definitely part of the cost. Yeah. Um, Another, another thing, you know, you want to trust your employees, and, and we do, and we do our best there. Sometimes there is theft or just shrink in general. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, somebody's running too fast, you don't have the parts locked down. It really depends on the infrastructure of the shop, but it's very common. If you don't have software like Full Bay to be able to have technicians placing parts on jobs, then you got people grabbing inventory and, and trying to remember to write it down. So um, definitely there's something to be said about having a parts room or having parts secure and then using a software application that's decrementing inventory and allowing the people to consume and apply it to a job versus putting it on paper. So why do we, why do we kind of belabor this point? Well, it's, and, and most of you are saying 15%, that's pretty close. I mean, yeah. you understand that this is a high cost. Why does it matter? Um, let's jump in, we're gonna get there. Only question number two, uh, the third one's gonna be at the very end, but do you store your inventory in specific bins or service truck locations. So I'm gonna launch this, this poll. Do you guys, do you guys carefully track where your inventory is stored? And so, some of you might have software that only has one location. You're not able to track it in service trucks or sure. other locations. So it's kind of interesting when we do a lot of onboarding. Um, I just, I don't know, the last month, 30 of them, I just onboarded myself. I know we got some other folks, but it's just amazing that they're like, oh, you can store parts on a service truck? Well, they can do that? Yeah. Absolutely, and we can restrict the sales from that uh, uh, technician to the service truck. So he's not decrementing your shop inventory, he's only decrementing the inventory on the service truck. Right, yeah, exactly. It's a powerful concept. Absolutely. Uh, looks like we got about 80%. I'm gonna close the poll and uh, share the results here. So we've got, it looks like uh, most um, of our participants, got, well, half of them are storing it in detailed locations um, or all in the parts room or about 10%. Yeah. Haven't, haven't right. quite set that up yet. That's cool. great. That's great to hear. And um, if you're not already using some of the features in Full Bay, uh, there's, there's definitely a, a great opportunity to get very specific and you can tell that some of you are doing that. Cool. All right. So let's... Let's jump in here. Why does the carrying cost matter? Why does it matter where you're storing? So, Chris. I mean, I, you know, I just always, I keep it real simple. Inventory is cash. You know, there was some, some uh, shop that I was recently talking to that had a little over $200,000 in inventory. And when you're carrying that kind of money and you're trying to cut payroll and you've got business opportunities and you're trying to expand, you basically have 200,000 of your cash sitting on the shelf somewhere. So if, if, you know, if I had 200,000 in cash, I probably would have it in a bank. I'd know exactly what bank it was and I'd probably memorize the account number on that bank. Um, so that's kind of the way I see it is that, 
inventory is the equivalent of cash. The moment you don't think it's cash, that's when it starts getting mismanaged. So knowing where it's at at all times, super important, super critical. Yeah, definitely. And the rule of thumb is that not knowing where your inventory is, is not making you more money. It's doing the opposite. Correct. It's just the leaky bucket, right? It's just, it's dropping out. You don't even realize it's happening. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about uh, purchase orders. What, why does that matter when you're, when you're dealing with inventory first? You know, we, we see it a lot and I, you know, without calling out as any specific vendors, I think that vendors are just like shops where, you know, they, they're hiring people, they've got new people, um, you're buying parts all the time. Maybe you're used to, you know, what we used to do was we used to put a PO number was the, the asset number. So, you know, Taylor, uh, trailer 1075, we, you know, we would just buy parts against our asset numbers and that was our PO. Well, we quickly found out that, um, you know, we started getting charges for parts to trailers that, you know, the parts didn't even belong on a trailer. We were getting light automotive uh, charges and different stuff tied to our assets. So I believe in a PO system, but it's very hard to manage a paper PO system. So, um, but the idea behind it is anytime you purchase something to a job or purchase something to inventory, you have a transaction and an identifying number that authorizes that vendor for the purchase of those goods. It's a basic concept. Most of you all are using it. You've got an open account with the vendor. Right. It's, we talked about this in a webinar a couple, a couple webinars ago. Yeah, absolutely. Now I will say this, just one thing on POs. I know we use an automated uh, PO. It randomly generates. It's alphanumeric. And I believe we're going to be moving that to pure numeric. Right. That's in one of our releases that's coming out. I believe it's this week or next week. Yep. We've heard some feedback from some of you. So just in general, if you're using Full Bay today, um, thumbs up on the automated POs, the feedback on having full number versus alphanumeric, you'll see that coming. But if anyone is not using POs or is standardizing it, overriding what Full Bay's doing, I strongly encourage you to, to, to let the process uh, take place. Um, I, we, I just worked with a, uh, an accounting team this morning and without those POs and those unique records, we weren't able to go back and figure out the problem or the user error. So it's a very powerful tool to use for auditing. Let's talk about the categories of parts. I mean, if you've got all the time in the world, you can sit down and say, all right, I've got filters, I've got batteries, brass, you know, nuts and bolts, so on and so forth. That can be a fun exercise if you have got plenty of time on your hands. Does that actually help you in your managing your inventory? How, how do categories actually help? Yeah, you know, I it, again, for me, categories, it's kind of nice to be organized. If you're kind of OCD and you like everything in nice uniform columns and rows, categories can be pretty cool to just add another tag or a label, but they're actually more powerful than that. You can leverage those for different pricing uh, scales or different pricing matrix. We'll get into some of that. But there is some um, there 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 is some value in having categories. And one thing I like, I've seen a lot of systems out there. And a lot of times, what ends up happening with these categories, you create an acronym like CRM, and then you got to remember what that is. And you're like, oh, that's that vendor. And you're talking about inside the part number. Yeah, inside the part number, or or even if the system you have can take a category, but you can't properly label it. You only get three characters. Right. I've seen where these categories haven't been functional, so some people have abandoned them in the past. Whereas, um, again, I'm kind of you know uh, weighing my opinion because I've seen Full Bay and I use it frequently, but it's nice to be able to just label a category a category. If yeah. a duck's a duck, call it a duck. Yeah, and Don't have it be. <laughs> I mean, the great thing about not having it, I mean, you can build it into the part number and that's good, but another, like you mentioned, a good thing about having a category separately is um, it can be leveraged for so much. We're going to talk about reporting here in a couple minutes, but, and then, um, driving reports, driving how much filters are marked up versus how much batteries are marked up. There's going to be a difference there, right? If you're on a filter program, you want to take advantage of the fact that you nailed that program the yeah. ball winner or whoever. Yeah. Or if you want to place an order for filters, having a category, letting you just organize your order. Exactly. I want to see all the filters, regardless exactly. of the part number or where I'm buying them. I just want to see all filters. Yeah, definitely exactly. some value in categories. Exactly. So, bottom line, knowing where your inventory is, uh, super important for basic inventory management. Um, it, it, inside Full Bay, you're able to print off barcodes. If you've got a uh, a barcode printer, they're not they're not super cheap. Probably three four hundred bucks. Uh, typically, they're made by Zebra. They're a thermal printer. Um, but we see a lot of customers printing out barcodes and tracking inventory that way. How, how have you seen that help, Chris? 
Yeah, most recently too, labeling the slot, you know, turning a one by four and labeling the slot so you can kind of have some sort of recognition of, you know, instead of a different number on the slot than what you're, you're putting on the pack. Um, but the idea is the receiving, right? Like how, how are you receiving? Where I come from, anywhere you received, you labeled the product where you had an itemized receiving process. Yeah. I know it's kind of hard in the shop sometimes. Um, many of the shops we talk to, you know, nobody can receive other than the office. And I know that that's not always reasonable or realistic, especially when you're kind of firefighting. Um, but it is cash, right? And it is real money. And it's not like you're making copies of your debit carding and handing it out to everybody, right? So right. this receiving process, I think it's critical to whether you're using the barcode feature or not, at least having a receiving process where it's controlled, using a system, whether it's full bay or using the process that we have established where you're signing off on those documents, you're verifying what you paid for that, that part, you're acknowledging receipt of it, and um, uh, you know properly doing what I would call a standard inventory receiving transaction, which most of you do. If you're new to it and anyone in the shop can receive and you're struggling with you got a bill for 10 grand and you can't figure out where the 10 grand went and where it came from. Right. Standardizing your receiving process and having a tool like Full Bay makes it very, very easy to go back and reconcile the numbers. Yeah, the process is important. We didn't invent the concept of the three-way match or anything like that. They, they're, they're basic uh, principles of accounting controls. Yes. And one of the reasons why huge companies are required to follow controls is to protect their shareholders because at the end of the day, they want their money not wasted, right? Well, it's not a bad idea to adopt some some pretty practical controls, even though you're running, you're not a big public Fortune 500 company. It doesn't matter, you can still adopt these. I remember um, when I was working in a shop, we were doing so many good things, you know, we were getting ready to launch full day, so on and so forth, and um, I was dealing with um, kind of the receiving of parts a lot and dealing with vendor bills, and it was, it was fun, but it also got super frustrating when you were it always felt like we were taking two steps forward and then maybe one step back because there would always be this vendor bill that would pop up and nobody knew what it related to. And um, trying to nail down exactly what 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 uh, what job that was connected to, if you're not using a PO and if you're not tracking who received the part, so on and so forth, it becomes very difficult. And um, once you adopt the control around receiving parts directly into full way, use that receive part screen, suddenly, it's a little annoying to do, I get it, but suddenly there's a full track record and you, you can take two steps forward and no more of these, you know, one steps back, you know, taking these hits on these invoices that you can't trace anywhere. You know, and for a growing shop too, just, just, a, just one point to make too on that is, if you're a growing shop and you're wondering, well, I, I, I would love to be as big as that other shop, or how did they get to be 50 locations, or how did that company get to be worth a billion dollars? That didn't happen Discipline. by loose, sloppy yeah. processes. Believe it or not, we've all, and many of you have worked at dealerships and other stuff, and you've, you've seen the red tape, and you've seen all the stuff that comes along with it. There's something to be said about standardizing a process and following it, and it's pay me now or pay me later. So if you're taking shortcuts now because you think it's faster, somebody in the office is gonna rework and invest the same amount of time, probably for more money. It doesn't have to be red tape, it doesn't right. have to be unreasonable. Yeah. basic discipline yeah, exactly. and it's just like a good point all this stuff that's in your workflow it's just like a scan tool i got a new scan tool it was hard to it's hard to operate right it's hard to operate for the first month or two but now that i got it i can look up any car I want. it's just like the scan tool i just retired so i think once you learn the process as, as somebody who's uh, technical or you're you're in this industry you're gonna it's gonna be like the back of your hand right first time you do a wheel seal it's gonna be a rough one about 1,000 wheel seals later, you can close your eyes and do it in bed. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next one. All right, next next concept. All right, so if you know where your inventory is, you should probably count it. I would say count it. <laughs> and I'm, we've talked about this a lot, or we talked about this before. We, we'll talk about it in our different calls and stuff, but I'm a big advocate of cycle counting. That's where you find your problems. Yeah. And um, you know, one of the things that's important too is, uh, you know, there's a difference in full bay. We have a cycle count, and we have an adjustment. And I think that a lot of people are like, well, what is the difference? Well, cycle counting, you know, obviously it's the act of going out and counting your inventory, you're, you're set to a task, but there's an impact to that where you're gonna change financial value of your um, inventory asset account, right? You're gonna decrement inventory and um, increase inventory. 
but those transactions don't affect average cost, right? Um, in, uh, but manual adjustments impact inventory average cost. So if you're just manufacturing inventory, um, it's gonna basically have an impact to your average cost. If you go to full bay, click on the inventory, say you, get, you have 10, you make it into 20, your average cost is gonna be impacted. It's gonna say, oh, you've got more at that same average number, let me go re-average it again across all the inventory that you have in stock and come up with a different number. Um, but if you do a true cycle count, all you're doing is saying, I need to reconcile what's in my bay or my fixed lot. You Let's talk about in, cycle counts. Cycle so what's, what's the difference between a cycle count and a full-on inventory count? You know, I guess uh, they're, kind of, they're a little bit one and the same other than a cycle count is really looking for one of the number one things that you count in a cycle count is negatives. I'm not sure how many people out there count the negatives, but on a daily basis, I imagine there's uh, um, shops that have negative inventory. First thing I would do on a cycle count, I'd just start with my negatives. That's how negatives happen. It. Negatives happen. It, it's usually when you're running the shop like a well-oiled machine, oiled machine like you ought to be, negatives are still going to happen because of timing differences. Maybe you didn't receive the parts in the inventory before you sold them, so it ends up being negative temporarily. Right. And stuff happens in other cases, but you want to jump on it daily. Right? Daily, yeah. If you have a negatives problem, I wouldn't let it get the way we used to do it. Now, granted, on a larger scale, first thing in the morning, I mean, start of the morning before it even got busy, we brought people in an hour before uh, the shift started, and we literally cycle counted negatives. Now, obviously, on 40 some million dollars worth of inventory, we had a lot of negatives, right? But we reconciled those immediately. And then the root cause, why was this thing? Right, you start doing root cause analysis, you reconcile the slot, it usually involves cycle counting the slot. So some people are like, well, how would you reconcile negatives? I would go to full bay, go to the inventory, sort by the negative values, and I would go cycle count sort the slots. Sort the quantity column. Yep, sort the quantity column to negative, and literally go out there with my tablet, cycle count the slot, find out what happened. Yeah. Get them cleared up so the rest of your day is smooth. After that, it's really three categories. Um, I refer to it as A, B, and C. Um, fast movers are A's, they move fast uh, monthly. Uh, mid movers are B's, they move uh, you know, like at a medium rate, you want to count them quarterly. Um, and then uh, slow movers, C's, and you count them semi-annual. So if you've got fast moving inventory, you want to count it monthly. Every single month, that slot should be on a list to count. It's fast moving, filters, et cetera. And why does that matter? We'll get to it. Yeah, and it, it's all about counting the cash, right? It's like reconciling the bank statement. I bet you everyone has a CFO or somebody in accounting who's watching the money and watching the ins and the outs and making sure you're not unbalanced and making sure you're not just losing money or someone got into your account, et cetera. Sure. It's just the right thing to do um, to keep inventory, um, well, one, to prevent negatives, but also to, to keep track of your inventory and find a problem. You have a receiving error on, a, um, on some Freon or something, you could actually be underselling it or right. overselling it. Right. If you're so busy and you're overselling it, that could cost you a whole deal with an account. You, you accidentally priced it at 20 bucks a, a unit when it should have been two bucks a unit. You got away with it for three or four months, but then all of a sudden your customer called in that, you know, we're, we're pulling the business, you're too expensive, and you find out it was because of this issue. It's kind of like, uh, you used an analogy once that I thought was really good. Um, and in the early days of Fullbay, we actually had this term on the office page, but it was um, yard work. Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, you gotta. If you have a yard, you gotta pull the weeds, mow the lawn, you know, spread some fertilizer every now and then, and keeping track of your inventory. That first bullet point on the list, the quantity on that left list should match the quantity you actually have. You gotta stay on top of it because random stuff happens, right? If weird things happen in the shops, and so forth. You want to be on top of that before it starts having ramifications. Yes. And it's gonna make you more money if you're on top of it. Yeah. It's going to make you more money. So. If you want to scale and grow, this is like this is like a building block. You talk about a foundation, a house is built on a foundation. If you're building your business and you don't have inventory nailed down, you're, you're going to have a problem. This is the foundation of your you're, business. You're not getting, you may still be profitable, but the profit won't be as high as it otherwise would be. Exactly. It just won't. Yep. Um, all right, next thing, stock only what you need. So we talked about carrying costs, why carrying costs are important. And uh, real quick, this concept of JIT, just in time, Inventory is pioneered by Toyota. The Toyota production system is what they call it now. But um, one of the ways uh, uh, Toyota became the premier, you know, car manufacturer in the world was th they were just so good at eliminating waste and making things efficient 
And one of the concepts was only have the inventory on hand that you need at the moment you need it, right? And uh, the goal is to keep, a, keep as little on hand as you need it. Obviously, there's going to be advantages to that because then you aren't exposed to as much carrying costs, right? Um, now, what uh, we're not proposing something radical here at all. I mean, most shops are already doing JITs. It's called special order parts, right? So anytime you don't have a part in stock, you're going to order it from Fleet Pride or Napa or whatever, have them deliver it. That's essentially JIT, right. and and that's okay. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is essentially uh, stocking as much as you can think of, right? Like filters. You have a yeah. fleet of Amazon trucks or FedEx trucks or whatever, and you know that there's a specific international or Freightliner or Kenworth, whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you don't want if there, you don't. You got the bullet point here, but you don't want to run special order to the point where you've got technicians going out and grabbing filters for every PM. Right. That's just ridiculous. It, you're, you're, those carrying costs that you that the labor, just the manpower or the, the person power that you're putting toward it and the expense that you're not calculating, 30 minutes on a tech. Now, if you're billing door to door and you're getting it back, you're just increasing the bill, right? Maybe you make yourself whole, but it's not productive. Right. It's not productive time and it's not productive, especially when you know it's going to happen like a PM. So in dealing with inventory, there's two competing forces. It's this healthy tension. On one hand, carrying cost is, is eating away your profit, and it just is. It's there. So you have carrying costs. On the other end, you've got the cost of processing an order, whether it's sending a $100 an hour technician out to pick up a part or just the cost of your parts manager doing the normal ordering process and receiving in. Those two things, carrying costs and the processing costs, are in constant demand, and you kind of have to figure out how to balance, like how much you want to keep in stock. Yeah, absolutely. Is it? Is there a science to this? Is, I think there might be a science. I think we okay. might have a slide on this because I was like, "Whoa!" Okay. <laughs> Next but, slide. Here we go. So, um, first, a little bit of theory. So, the soft tooth diagram here is a classic way to kind of address what inventory um, should should be behaving like, right? So. Over here, uh, you start at your max, right? It's just like in full day. You got your min and your max. Your min really is, and uh, we're, t we're tweaking some code over the next few weeks here. The min is really going to be the reorder point. Um, when you hit your min, you really ought to be reordering at that point. That's the bottom here. And if there is a significant lead time, you can kind of bake that in. But um, the black is representing the stock over time. So you're going to consume it. You hit your min, reorder it, consume it, hit your min, reorder it. So the question is, you know, what? How often should you should you be ordering this? What should your max be? And um, how does a shop go about figuring this out, Chris? Yeah, I think that you know, for the most part, a lot of people look at they're they're, they're taking spreadsheets or they're looking at demand in full bay, looking at what the sales look like for the last month, and then you're kind of thumbing it, right? Yeah. You're like, well, it looks like we're running about ten. So I'll bring 10 in, or maybe I'm going to put a little pad in. I'll bring two more and we'll call it 12. Right. Um, and I think if there's a little bit of guesstimation and there's a little bit of spreadsheet, right? But I don't know that it's any more sophisticated than that. Um, and I think that there's some other ways, um, you know, some of the stuff that we've talked about. There's, there's definitely, when you're doing, you know, $40 million worth of inventory, you're no longer allowed to just kind of guesstimate and look at trends and averages. Right. They help. It's a great baseline and it's a great place to start but it's not necessarily uh, the one that you make the million dollar decision on. Right. So there is some other tools out there that will, that I think help in general though, I think sometimes with min max, I'll run into, say we're in, we're doing an onboarding and we're doing a kickoff call. I'll run into an account that it's really um, someone just decided theoretically, I would like to have 20 at all times, regardless of they right. sold. Yeah, yeah. Like they feel right. Like, Oh, we should always have, it looks better on the shelf. Yeah, I like my shelves full. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, and what I found is is difficult when you're if you're managing that way. It, it, it's great, you know. There's it's great display. Um, there's there's some attributes of that, but separate from that, when you start having to process the inventory, what do you? Let's say your inventory guy goes or, or gal goes on vacation, and I'm filling in for them, and you've got these min maxes. Well, Full Bay is going to tell me, oh, I'm I'm below this min. I should I should go ahead and order these. I'm going to order. Based on your max setting, it's going to predict I should fill the shelf back up. Well, we've seen time and time and again that that happens with whether you have full bay or you don't have full bay, and then you have this huge inventory bill. 
And it's like, why did you order all this stuff? And then you're doing returns. Well, in the end, it was just somebody decided to have a theoretical max and a theoretical min. It should really be based on your movement. So if you're going to use, you're better off not setting a min max if you're just using theory. If you're actually using a process, set it. It'll help you. It'll help you keep the right levels in stock. You can have someone go on vacation. And kind of the days of the, 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 the parts manager who's kind of the master with voodoo and they got the Ouija board and they just know how it works. You can basically get all of that out of their heads and into the system so right. it's scalable and sustainable and you got legitimate min max. Bake it in. Bake, bake it, it in. in. Yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. Automate. You want to relieve yourself from all that stress, bake it in, automate it. That's the way to do it. Okay. This is all you have to do right there. See, I knew there was some science. Just, yeah. I knew there was some science. I saw that one time in a, in a calc class and um, <laughs> So Believe it or not, uh, being a street guy, I did pass calculus, uh, and I accepted a B plus instead of an A. Yeah, B plus is respectful. I went to I, so here's a quick story, just for a little a break here. I went to Mexico to party on spring break, and the teacher said, "Would you like an A? You can come and take this test, or you can settle for your B and take off." And so I took off. So that's my that's my last calculus Very tough story. <laughs> Well, this this one's pretty pretty straightforward to to calculate. You don't need to integrate or do any actual calculus. Um, this is the economic order quantity. So there's actually a mathematical formula. This is it for figuring out what is the best quantity given uh, the cost to carry inventory, given your ordering costs, and given how much of a particular part you use during the year. So what your annual demand is. So all you got to do is. Uh, Kind of plug it in here, and we're going to show you a real life example here. So, yeah, because this 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 slide looks way better than the last slide, right. Jacob. I'm all thumbs up. So let's walk <laughs> through this one. So, B99 filter. You guys have seen this before. Uh, let's walk through this. Let's say uh, we're paying 11 bucks a filter. We're on the the bad program, right? <laughs> we don't have. I changed that to 11. We, we didn't do the deal with Baldwin yet. <laughs> so 11 bucks. Uh, let's. We've got our 20 percent. So at 11 dollars, that filter costs us 2 dollars and 20 cents a year to carry just the one filter. All things being equal. Um, uh, so we know 220 is the carrying cost annual. That's on the one extreme. The other extreme is well, um, how much does the cost of process is? So let's say we've got a 25 dollar an hour employee um, handling the ordering and receiving and all of that and well, let's say uh, to do a, an order here, all in, order hour. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So that's that's our 0.25 there. So $6.25 every time we order these filters. Uh, so we've got the two ends of the spectrum. So all you got to do is plug this in. Let's say we sell 240 of these a year. We just plug that in. What would our economic order quantity be? Um, we just plug it into this filter that we had over here, and it spits out 37. That's what we would need. Um, now, what does that mean? So some of you are like, okay, well, what does 37 mean? So if you're, I guess to tie all this together, if you're doing a JIT environment and you're trying to figure out what you should stock in your mins and maxes, one of the things that's kind of neat about this thing, if you did the exercise, and I, I would say, you know, practically you'd probably do this on something that was fast mover or that you felt like the shop was in a whirlwind. Um, but if you're running around and you feel like you're in just chaos and whirlwind with parts, are you buying it too fast? This is going to help say, okay, well, if demand, if, if the average demand is, is 20 a month and you're, you know, you're, so annually it's 240 um, and you keep running around buying 10 every two weeks or five a week or 20, this is basically saying, well, maybe you should buy that a little bit less and more of it. You've got the demand, you've got an impact to cost. Maybe right. you should buy a little bit more and, and, and reduce some of that uh, carrying costs. So we can run a couple different scenarios. Um, as, the cost of the, as the cost of the part goes down, obviously the carrying cost is gonna go down and that's gonna justify us keeping more on hand, right? right? So let's say we negotiate the deal and we get it down to $7. So at 11, our EOQ is 37. If we take this down to seven, watch what happens down here to the economic order quality. Now we can justify ordering 46 at a time, all other things being equal. Um, let's say that uh, we speed up the processing of the part orders, or we get a different resource on it. Let's say we get this down to 0.1 hours. Well, now suddenly it's justifiable to order it more frequently, right? Yeah. So you can see as the cost of processing an order goes down, 
you're justified in getting closer to JIT. As the cost of, as the annual carrying cost of the, uh, uh, the part goes down, you're justified in ca carrying more in stock. So those are kind of the healthy tensions that are, that are taking place here. And uh, more than happy to share this formula with you if, if you would like. Um, and we're working on throwing a tool on our website so you can just plug this stuff in. Um, but uh, that is economic order quantity. Everyone gets a degree. You didn't ever... Everyone we're going to get a degree. certificate. We just got our bachelor's degree. Exactly. EOQ. EOQ. So moving on. Polling question number three. This is our last polling question. Do you price your parts based on a markup percentage or based on a margin percentage? What's your starting point? Is it markup percentage or margin percentage? I'm going to launch this question. Let's see what we got here. I'm always fascinated by this one. Okay, we're up to about 80%. All right. I'm close that poll, share the results. Wow. Look at that. It's about an even split, but most are starting with a margin. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Let's take that. Let's dig deeper into this. This is a very important topic. This whole concept of, at the end of the day, you gotta make sure you're, Oh, I gotta sorry. stop the. Uh, hey guys, I gotta results. keep this guy in line. So yes, I'm just thank you. To share a screen. So at the end of the day, um, I just preach this. I'm gonna keep preaching it. You have to make yourself whole. So people want it. They go to church. They don't want to rip people off. They feel bad charging a margin. But at the end of the day, you got it. It's no margin, no mission, right? It's a hospital here in town run by a bunch of nuns. St. Joseph's a great hospital. The reason they've been able to stick around is even a nonprofit has to have a margin so that they can fund capital expenses and so forth. You're not in business. You're not running a .org. Um, <laughs> even if you are, there still needs to be a margin in there. So uh, let's, let's dig in here and understand kind of the difference between markup and margin. Chris, you want to? Well, I'll take the easy one. Markup is just easy to calculate, right? It basically says, I bought a part for a hundred bucks. I want to mark it up 20%. I'm going to sell it for 120. Yeah. I've got 20% markup. It's easy math. I see it a lot. It's super easy for me to build a scale on that because yeah. it's, there's less effort, right? And if you mark it up at 20%, your profit margin is 20% too, right? Well, not quite. Correct. Right. That was close. I wanted to say yes, but no, no, no. Unfortunately, it's way. not. Unfortunately, it's not. All right, so margin is the profit that's left over after you, so you take the selling price and subtract out the cost, you get a profit, and then divide that into the retail price. So margin is always going to be lower than markup. So markup can go way above 100%. You could mark something up 200% and be justified in doing it. Say it's, you know, it's a 50 cent part that you charge buck 25. The only way you're going to get up there is to go above 100% on the markup. Margin is mathematically impossible to get above 100%. It is impossible. Yes. Right. So, um, because there's always going to be some kind of a kind of a cost in there. In all the accounts, I will say there were two people that wanted 100 more than 100% margin. That was the most difficult onboarding call. That's I a tough one. That yeah. was a tough one. So, uh, now that we've established that, what can you do with this? So. It doesn't really matter. They're just both sides to the same formula, markup versus margin. Um, it's important though to know for your region, if, if all the vendors in your area are running on margin and you go on markup, you left money on the table. If all your vendors in the area are running on, uh, like, like say you're selling against Kenworth and they're doing percent, if they're, if they're calculating based on markup, um, I think that that's important. I've seen some people in a region switch to margin because they heard something like here, we're on a webinar, you hear margins better, you know, drive up the margin. Um, and they hear some percentage that may have been actually a, a profit margin, they plug it in as a markup. Right. And suddenly they're... Either way, it goes both ways. Just make sure you understand how your region or your market's running. We have some people that say all the competition's running on margin. So you want to calculate everything based on your 
your margins, numbers. know the formula, know your math, make sure right. you're solid there. So in Fullbit, we have this great thing where you can use multiple parts matrices. We, um, we actually renamed them to be parts pricing scales because we added some functionality a few months ago to, to build a true matrix, so a three-dimensional uh, matrix. And so what you can do now, in the past, you would just assign a essentially a markup scale to a particular shop. customer. Yeah, or maybe just the shop had one markup scale. What we've added is you now have the ability to apply a different markup scale depending on which vendor you bought the part from. So I, for inventory, it's based on who the preferred vendor is, but who the related vendor is, what part category is involved. So uh, let's talk about that. If, if I've got a great filter program, I'm probably gonna use a different markup scale specifically for that category of parts for filters. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We see that a lot. You, Every shop should have some form of a part scale in place, right? That graduates, this graduated list is part uh, cost increase, the scale decreases in the amount of margin or markup that you're getting on the part. Yeah. But that, that's a great point. We see that a lot. Someone's got a filter program. Someone's got a local dealership like Freightliner and the most that they can get out of it is 20%. So you try to use this, mate, this this price scale that's running across the shop as a default, it works 80% of the time, and then it doesn't work when you buy parts from a specific vendor, or it doesn't work because you got a Baldwin or a Fleet Guard filter program, and you need to hit that with you know 250% markup based yeah. on your program. So that's important. You can also do this based on, you can categorize your customers and say, look, um, for, for all my customers that are tagged as a retail customer, I want this markup scale to apply, but then you can layer, excuse me, on top of that and say, but if it's a Baldwin filter, use this markup scale, right? And yes. uh, there's, I, I think there's three, four different uh, components that you can throw onto that and make it a true pricing matrix. So uh, for those of you using full bay, this is as simple as going to your shop configuration page. So top right, click on configuration, click on your shop, and it's near the bottom of the page where you build the parts pricing matrix, and what's really cool is you can do all that on the shop level, but then you can also go on to specific customers and do one-offs. So if you have a set deal with a certain customer on filters or on Napa parts or whatever, you can go on to the customer level and do a completely different matrix setup there so that they are treated that way, but then all the other customers are treated based on what's set up at the shop level. It's really cool, it's very effective, yeah, like private, whether it's a private fleet or it's your own internal fleet, your, your service trucks. If you're yeah. servicing your own service trucks, one way is to put together different part scales or go to the customer and just set sure, your sure. own customer up. Anytime you work on your trucks, you don't mark up your parts. Yeah, sure. And I, and I know we've got some internal fleets on the calls, so I apologize for all the talk about markup. But um, if you guys ever decide to service outside customers with excess capacity of your shop, the tools are all in there for you guys to easily mark these things up so you can... Um, have have a profit margin on those. And if you're going multi-location or you're wondering, does this scale for dealership? The last dealership I set up, I think we did 47 different parts uh, scales and matrix combinations. And that was a super in-depth vendor category. It can become a customer. science project. But the reality is your parts manager may be doing this stuff inside his or her, her head anyway. It's well, in their head. It's funny you say that. The person at the dealership literally needed a week to compose themselves and put it onto a spreadsheet just to understand what they actually had in their existing system. There were so many codes and acronyms on categories. They, they literally had to get their The owner of the company didn't even know how parts were marked up at the right. dealership. Right. By the time we were done, we put it all in layman's terms because you can customize all these fields in full bay. We built all the scales and the matrices. Anyone now, owner wants to know what the markup is, you can go right to the settings and see it. Yeah, definitely take advantage of this. It's part of this whole concept, bake it in, right? Instead of it being in somebody's head, get it out of their head so that person doesn't have to be involved with every single transaction that happens at the shop. Correct. They can take a vacation and um, anyway. So uh, make yourself whole. So make sure that you're adding up all the costs of um, of you know what does it cost to actually process your orders what is your carrying cost all these costs that we talked about add them all up and then on top of that layer a margin so traditionally we just mark up the parts based on the cost of the part itself but you got it when you're when you're figuring out what markup percentage to use or, or margin percentage 
you got to think about all those other costs that are real and they're there and they're not necessarily tied to that specific P99 filter. So um, don't uh, don't go beyond what you can charge in your particular market, but also don't sell yourself short because you've got to make yourself whole on this. If you want to stay in business and you want to be prosperous, you've got to mark it up uh, and cover your costs, even those hidden costs. And you know, there's one thing too, never underestimate the cost of uh, transportation, right? So, and what I mean by that is you're thinking supply chain, but I had somebody in Texas, um, she's running a, a shop in Texas. She oversaw the parts and she made a, uh, she made a point to me and it was pretty, it was pretty interesting. She said, when, when that part is on my service truck, 60 miles from the nearest town, it's worth a lot more than what it is in my shop. And so there's something to be said about when you're talking about these markup and margins, remember you can store things in different locations with full bay. You can also have multiple shops. So some of the shops are separating out the mobile fleet into its own shop so they can have a different parts markup, price matrix on against that particular shop. So they got the five mobile guys, the 10 mobile techs in their own shop, still in the ecosystem of full bay, and they're running you know, an additional 20 to 30% more on parts, the labor's a little bit more, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you've got a $100,000 service truck doing seven miles per gallon. Right. You've got different costs to go over there. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, if you if you think it costs the same to run the shop as a service truck, there is some implications there. Yeah, definitely. Okay, moving on. The pricing scale. So, uh, we'll skip over this uh, a bit, but those of you who are already full bay customers are already full bay customers. You you know this. You're familiar with this, and and you're gonna have something like this um, set up for you. Obviously, depending on your market, it's gonna be different. But the concept here is that. You don't just put carte blanche a markup or margin percentage on all your parts. Depending on the cost of the part, you're going to mark it up differently. Typically, um, probably without exception, the lower the cost of the part, the higher the markup is going to get applied. You're not going to do a 100% markup on a $5,000 part, for example. Um, but of course, this is baked into full day. And what we were talking a minute ago about pricing scales, this is a pricing scale. and you could choose to have one of these just on the shop and be done with it, or you could have a different one for each customer, or you could start each vendor, each uh, category, a matrix, and yeah. assign it to vendors and so forth. So um, this is kind of the breakdown of where you can do this. So you can do it in full day at the customer level, um, each customer. The customers you can categorize into different price levels. And you can you can define the name of these. Um, we put some in by default, uh, retail, wholesale, fleet, whatever. But you can add as many as you need to to kind of segment your customers based on who they are. Um, you can do it different by vendor, by part category. And then uh, this is new. This just came out. Right. Um, you can also do it now based on the type of sale. So if you're selling that part over the counter versus if that part is part of a service order, you can now apply a different markup scale depending on where the part is actually sold. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, all right, um, kind of a peek here. We've got some upcoming inventory features. These are, these are scoped and getting built right now. Uh, centralized ordering uh, is coming here in the next few weeks, which is nice for the, uh, for the multi-shop locations. Um, the ability to import price files. So I was just talking to one of the parts houses this morning um, the ability to basically get a list of their latest prices by part number and import that into full day with the date so you can see what's fresh uh, that's coming. Uh, and then, of course, enhanced reporting. We've got a lot coming down the pike yeah. on that. Velocity, inventory turns, non-stock and dead inventory. Um, these things are just tools. It's all there and you can pivot table and get to some of this stuff, but we're just going to make it easier to bring that to the surface. Yeah, yeah exactly. just really bring it to the surface and kind of help you uh, manage it a little bit quicker and more efficient uh, if you're the person in the parts chair. So this is the point where we typically would uh, open it up for questions, but before we do that, we want to hear from you. What would you like to see from Full Bay next? Uh, in terms of inventory or any topic, really. Uh, if you guys don't mind, just throw that into the into the question section. We'd like to see that, and we can see we can see who's submitting it, so we can follow up with you. Yeah. Uh, so feel free to throw that in there. Whether it's a topic that you want to do on a webinar, or if you're interested in a feature that um, uh, you'd like to see us build, we do have a pretty packed roadmap this year, and it's all good stuff for real shop owners, but. Um, we always love the feedback and uh, just to sometimes reiterate or reinforce the track that we're on. 
So a lot of times that's that's what we're trying to do. And then um, I know some of you on the call could possibly say PDF invoice. Don't worry, we got a nail biter this week. I think we've been waiting every week for this one. They just rewrote the code again, uh, just for a latest to get version. Right. Yeah, they wanted to clean up. A, it was more about structure in the code database, but it, I believe that releases this week. It's so on Thursday. Yeah, yeah, you can email a email the PDF and the portal link. You get the best of both worlds. Let's dive into these questions. Get to as many as we can. So, is there any way to track a part for warranty purposes or any other reason without making it an inventory? Yeah, the only way really for invent uh, for warranty is you're, you're, it's usually at the asset level. You know, it's usually someone saying, "Hey, I've got unit one, two, three. It's broke again. It's that starter." Or you're you're going to you're managing it at the unit level. You're looking at the prior repairs. That's the only place. The one thing that we are going to do to help you with that is there's a uh, feature request to add the itemized parts to the download. So if you go to the service history, we give you the invoice download. We don't give you the itemized parts. Um, you'll see that as a new enhancement that'll be coming out in the near future. And it'll it'll help you with a little bit more depth. It's into definitely that an warranty. important topic. Definitely yeah. an important topic. Okay. In full bait, if you have consignment parts, how do you separate those parts from the parts you already own? For yeah. tax purposes. Yeah. So there's two there's two things. One, I always recommend, and in its current state today, um, I always recommend having some sort of uh, location that you're storing them in. For one, uh, even if that's the uh, acronym for the locate, it's the parent location, the consignment, um, so that you can easily filter those yep. parts and get to them fairly quickly. Yep. Um, category uh, is another way to organize those. And then if you if you need to put it right into the part name, like a, a CON or CN. C CGN and a semicolon. Um, that would be the, the, the way to do it today. Um, you still want to have a cost associated with those things. Some people have zeroed out the cost, um, but you're better off having the cost because when you go to sell it, you still want to mark it up. You still want it to hit that scale. And then what you obviously what you would do is you would receive in that bill to offset that expense. And that that's our current state today. Um, as part of the inventory uh, project that uh, Jacob just alluded to, you'll see a new feature called part types uh, coming out. Uh, I believe that's in September. Mm -hmm. And that will help you also. It'll basically just enhance the ability to manage uh, consignment parts. So uh, tighten up cores, consignment, yeah. all of this. Yeah. Basically going to make it its own part type so it can be segregated out of that inventory a little bit cleaner. Uh, but in general, uh, the naming convention, the location, at the end of the day though, if you're storing it for free and you're showing those as expenses, you're going to offset those with the receiving bill when you receive the part. It's yeah. all going to reconcile. Uh, next one, does fully have scanning capabilities? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you can print out the barcodes uh, when you're receiving the parts in the inventory or straight from the inventory list. One of the batch action op options at the bottom of the inventory list is to print the barcodes. And then, of course, uh, um, any off-the-shelf barcode scanner uh, that you're going to plug in via USB or whatever you can use to scan those barcodes and uh, what the bar barcode scanner does is output the uh, the part number information so you can you can do that yep. yeah mostly right now what we we've, we've got a few oh I don't know there's probably a dozen or so uh, over the part counter um, companies actually there's way more than that there's probably about 50 of them they basically have a uh, some of some of them have large kind of C stores like they one group uh, bought like an old Napa and so they have the front end of the shop is this uh, retail section and the back end is you know, the mechanic shop. We have some other folks that have a version of that, a smaller scale version of that. If you're doing over the counter sales like that, scanner uh, is the way to go. It's just like a checkout, right? People are going to walk up to the shelves, consumers, maybe they're not getting installs, they're going to come up. That's where you have those items all barcoded and you're going to take that scanner. Uh, I prefer wireless, you're not tethered to a machine, but you could do machine tethered and you're just going to scan them out just like you're at a checkout. That's the ideal solution today. I know that some other folks have been experimenting with uh, peripherals that attach to um, uh, like iPads. There's different technology out there that will attach and scan a barcode into a web-based browser. Um, we haven't uh, backed any of those just yet, but um, if you're looking for the actual phone or the iPad to scan to the job, that, uh, that currently is not available yet. Um, another question, we can print one barcode per eight and a half by 11 inch page rather than a sheet of 30 labels on the sheet. Currently the barcodes are formatted for a zebra printer, so it's gonna output um, 
on a zebra printer it's considered each label is considered one page that's why you're seeing it like that um, we will have a change coming where if you want to print it out say on a sheet of Avery labels uh, you're going to be able to but that currently you're not able to do that yeah it's just a standard one by four if you're using we had someone recently was um, using an old printer that they had that was a one by two well, you can get it to print, but you're going to get wrapping, right? The, it, you, we're not going to cut it off. We're going to wrap the label, but uh, a one by four is usually the standard. Um, does Foley have a feature where it will generate cycle counts for you by section? Not yet, but that is part of our inventory build. Coming. Yeah, so that's Coming. our September. We're on a big inventory wave right now, so you will see that. Uh, also, uh, there's a question about pulling a negative on hand report, same concept. Right. Yeah, it's the same thing that I believe that's uh, was listed on that other slide. The fastest way to do it, though, um, it's you know one of the things, and here's a good point. Full bay. What we're trying to do is not build full bay where you have to go to a report. You're in your workflow. You're staring at your inventory. You just need to see negatives. The the the, the view you're on is the report itself. All you have to do is click the sort button, and it'll instantly sort it to give you the negatives and reveal them right on your screen. If you need to see that and run multiple uh, and still do other work, duplicate the tab. Fullbay can be open on the same computer four, five, six times in the same browser with multiple tabs. So just if you're doing multiple things, make make a, a right click, duplicate the tab, sort it by negative, and then still go back and order parts and do whatever, and then just go back to your negative screen. Yeah, it's right there at your fingertips today. Can you send out the spreadsheet with the formula for economic order quantity? Yes. Yeah. We'll we'll send out a spreadsheet with the uh, slide reporting. I think we're able to do that. Yeah. Or we'll make so. it available to you. Yeah. Um, just about out of time. Lots of questions. Does that one say you this mentioned, is awesome? Yeah. I'm skipping those. <laughs> you mentioned parts manager. At what point do I need to have someone dedicated to parts? Oh, that's a great Chris? question. That's a good, well, it depends on the size of the shop. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if it, a lot of times we'll see four techs and one, uh, an owner that's kind of running both, uh, they've got like a lead tech. I, I would say that if you're starting to cross over 10 and getting into 15 techs, and it, again, it also look look at the revenue, right? You've got to be able to cover this with rev total revenue coming into the shop. But as you start to mature and you're starting to get to 10 techs and you got mobile techs on the road, you got people in the shop, you know, having a part-time office person start to take over inventory responsibilities, you're going to save so much time with full bay, slowly start transitioning somebody to start taking responsibility for the cycle counts and managing inventory. I've seen office people uh, uh, cover that role until your shop's mature enough, but I'd say usually 10 to 15 techs, you start needing a parts person uh, pretty consistently. And for the questions we don't get to, we'll follow up with you guys and get your responses. Uh, last question. Scenario, truck is in for repair, truck has to leave before all repairs are completed. Best way to handle parts left to be replaced? Put it back in inventory or a separate location until the truck returns to finish repairs. In a situation like that, wouldn't you just split the service order? Well, yeah, you could split the service order, but I think if, if it's received to the job and split the service order, I mean, if you're committing it, so the question is, do you want, you want to make the inventory? You want, invoice, you want to invoice for what's done. Yeah, invoice. yeah, so sorry, that for the financial side, split, split the uh, order so you can invoice to start collecting cash. Okay. Uh, for the inventory tracking side, the question you have to make is, do you want to make that available for sale and generate revenue? Or is it critical that that truck's coming back in two days? We want to hold it in a tubby or something. Yeah, like and that. you can't, that, that those parts took a week to get to Alaska or wherever you're at. Yeah. And um, I think that that's the business decision. I'm always selling the part, right? I need revenue, not a promise that you're coming back someday and then, you know, I've got to chase this down and I've got, you know, two sure. grand worth of uh, parts on the shelf. So I typically would return it for sale um, unless I knew that this was a guaranteed customer and then I would have a staging area. One, one of the things that you'll see as part of this, it's interesting that question came up, we're working with a group right now um, on, on this inventory build, you'll actually get a label. Remember the scope? Yeah. You'll get a label, label to tag you. that. Yeah. So when you're in the, you, you'll actually be able to tag the part with the job that it's for. So that when the job comes back, you know, you're like, what's that part for? Right. Um, you'll actually have a tag that you'll print right from full bay. Thanks, Chris. We're out of time. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. There will be a link sent out uh, where you can re-watch re this webinar uh, if you want to uh, hear us again. 
And uh, thank you for your time. And we look forward to, uh, to having you participate in our next webinar. For those of you who are uh, full bay customers, we are very grateful for you. For those of you who aren't, we'd love to have you come on board. And uh, hope you all have a great day. Thanks for participating. Thanks.